Welcome to the Raising Boys and Girls podcast. I'm Sissy Goff. I'm David Thomas. And I'm Melissa Trevathan. And we are so glad you've set aside a few minutes to spend with us today. In each episode of this podcast, we'll share some of what we're learning in the work we do with kids and families on a daily basis at Daystar Counseling in Nashville, Tennessee. Our goal is to help you care for the kids in your life with a little more understanding, a little more practical help, and a whole lot of hope. So pull up a chair and join us on this journey from our little yellow house to yours. Hey there, Sissy Goff. Don't we have an important reminder for our podcast listeners? We sure do. Have you gotten your tickets for the Raising Boys and Girls podcast tour? This tour means we're going to be able to connect face-to-face with you all, and we could not be more excited about that. We wish we could come right to all of you, but for now, we're hitting four cities on the tour in August. Grab tickets at raisingboysandgirls.com slash tour or check our show notes for a direct link to the tickets. We are beyond excited to meet you all in person, talk about developing healthy and nurturing relationships with our children and have some fun together. This tour is going to be a fantastic opportunity to connect and create a community of parents who are dedicated to raising healthy and hopeful boys and girls. So make sure to mark your calendars, invite your friends and go right now to raisingboysandgirls.com slash tour. Thank you all for your support and for being part of this incredible journey with us. We truly can't wait to meet you all on the Raising Boys and Girls podcast tour. Tom Douglas is an Academy Award, Golden Globe, and Grammy-nominated songwriter. Tom's first song, Little Rock, was recorded by Colin Ray in 1994, which reached number one earned a nomination for CMA Song of the Year and achieved the Millionaire Award from BMI for receiving one million spins on country radio. Since then, Tom has written numerous number one hits for Lady A, Tim McGraw, the Grammy Award-winning song The House That Built Me, recorded by Miranda Lambert, and many others. Last year, Tom released the documentary film Love Tom, along with a companion album inspired by the movie. We are so honored to be able to sit down with Tom and his lovely wife, Katie, to talk about life and parenting. We all know that behind every successful man is an incredible, strong woman. Katie definitely fits that description. They are such an amazing power couple. You two, this is such a gift. Mm, we we kind of yes. can't really believe this is happening. I know, We've I been know. talking about it a long time, and it's it's real today that we would get to sit with Two folks that we love and admire and respect mm. and have conversation Amen. with you. Amen. And Both of you. just this week, uh, Kate, well, I'll begin by saying that Katie has been a longtime friend of Daystar and excited in a minute for you to even track back in time to talk about how long ago your relationship with Melissa started. But to say, as we record this this week, we are... Um, just a week out from the great tragedy in our city. Um, and and Katie has day in, day out been literally in this house. She's been on our board for many years, and she's been in this house baking cookies every day. The house has smelled like fresh cookies as kids and families are walking mm. in with so much grief and sadness. And she hugs us every time we walk mm. by, and it has been Between sustaining. Between every session, yes. I think sustaining mm. yeah. and life-giving. Yeah. <laughs> As you always are. It's just truth. who you are. I don't know that I know a person more encouraging. Wow. Oh, sissy. I'm serious, <laughs> it's Katie. It's the truth. I'm serious. And you all have some of the best TV recommendations of anyone we know. <laughs> we always love to talk to you about truth. TV. Yes. So let's begin by, Katie, will you just even talk about how you met Melissa and then Talk a little bit about why you would want to be on a board for a counseling organization for kids. Mm. Okay, let's see. <clears throat> I've told this story so many times. Let me see if I can. I'm one of seven. I have four sisters, two brothers, and my oldest I sister, forget Julie. That. Seven, yes. Katie. Right. So I have two older sisters. Wow. And they were always doing, they were the athletes, they were involved in the young life, they were always 
the it girls, and I, the third daughter, would tag along. Well, mm. my oldest sister, Julie, was somehow she got to know Melissa Trevathan. Now, this would be, I bet Julie was 16, 17, so I was early. You know, I, I'm four years younger than Julie. Anyway, <clears throat> Julie, good friends with Melissa Trevathan. And, um, and so it was through that that as Julie became part of Melissa's life, she invited her little sisters along. And then as Melissa was um, doing what Melissa does, which is she was drawing people around her to do mm. life. We were, she was taking us to Panama City Beach. Now, when you're 14, you just want a really good tan. So I was like, <laughs> I was like yes, I will go. And um, was, this part of a, was this part of the youth group, Emmanuel? No. 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 Okay. This was, was a darling in kids. little cutie, Melissa Trevathan, invested in kids. Mm. And because she was such good friends with my sister, Julie, and Nita Baugh. Mm -hmm. Nita Baugh was best friends with my sister, Janie. Mm. We were just a group. And there were some young, goofy teenage boys also in this group who would do fun things. Um, Melissa would take us whitewater rafting down the Nantahala. <laughs> sure she would. Yeah. To the beach. Fun things. But... The bottom line was it was fun. It was you're with people who I've always felt at home. Mm. And that's why when I'm here, so I'll, mm. that's how I got to know Melissa, through that. Um, but it is true that one trip, and I can't remember where we were, but we were on some trip, and we found ourselves, as we would every evening, we'd end up in some room and there wouldn't be enough chairs for everybody. Some would end up on the floor, but Melissa would say, all right, y'all, now we're going to open God's Word, and mm. she would point us to Christ. Mm. And <clears throat> so that is that was my, um, my relationship with Melissa. But one trip, she opened up the Word, and we were talking, and she said, y'all, we need to name this, this group. And then she pointed to a scripture. What scripture is it, Sissy, the David, the one that Second has Second Peter Daystar. one nineteen, yeah, is that from right? Peter, yeah. Yeah. She said, how about Daystar? And it's like, yeah, sure, why not? And I mean, that was a while ago. And then as Melissa's ministry has, has had different, you know, um, mm -hmm. seasons, mm -hmm. meaning this house wasn't built back then. Right, right. But um Because that was that came what, to be nineteen. What a, it was I mean, a long time she ago. She officially incorporated Daystar in 1985. Right, really so this started. was so this before that. Been, yes. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So that time it was Wow. And, and I... Um, and no one was really talking about counseling back then. No. So it wasn't mm -hmm. even... Yeah. Right. None of us were. And none when, of us were in it as kids, When you sure. are one of seven siblings mm. and you find yourself in a group uh, with other teenagers... And and with a, a young adult like Melissa, and when you feel seen and you mm. feel, I feel like she delighted in me mm. in all my goofiness. Mm. And trust me, I was the goofiest of all the sisters, <laughs> but I always felt seen and delighted in. And mm. when I walk in the door here, I notice not only does Melissa make others feel seen. Wow. I know. It's emotional, especially this week. Yeah. Mm. But you all, you that's what you do. Mm. I've seen it with mm. these goofy teens, these mm. darling littles that come in, and I know they feel seen and they feel delighted mm. in. Mm. Mm. Wow. Mm. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you. <laughs> we enjoyed it. That, that's why I'm that so terrific. honored oh, to be um, wow. to be a part of Daystar. Mm. And as you two have used your gift set to um, to love the community, love these children, mm -hmm. I'm um, I'm just so mm -hmm. I am just humbled mm -hmm. to be affiliated with you mm -hmm. and the way the Lord's using you. Mm -hmm. So thank you for all you're doing. Thank you. <laughs> See everyone, one of the most encouraging people I've ever met. There you wow. go. There Man. you go, Katie. That was thank really you. eloquent. That was really eloquent. Delighted in is that's a that's a phrase, a verb that you really don't hear too mm. much. It's and it is it's kind of a shocking term mm. that you would delight in somebody. Just how that fills the other person with 
confidence and joy and you kind of let your shoulders down and you relax just to mm. be delighted in mm. wow i mean that is that's that is a powerful verb mm. it's hard to define what that means but i think we all know when it happens yes. 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 when it is happening yes. to us it's like i don't know i can't explain this but mm. yeah you feel it you mm-hmm. do feel it yeah yeah well tom <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm going to need a tissue, I'm sure. <laughs> I bet we got them around <laughs> wow. here. You are undoubtedly not only one of Nashville's most prolific songwriters, but I feel like you are so respected, so beloved in this town. And I feel like you, I mean, I don't, I don't know this other than just what I have watched happen with the people that I know. I feel like you mentor mm-hmm. 99% of the Yes. artistic community here. I mean, you have made such a difference. Well, thank you. Prolific means I just write a lot of songs. You do yes. know that. It's like, that doesn't mean that they're good. <laughs> I, well, they're, it's just, we're going to have already quantity. announced what a lot of them I, are, written, but I mean, are you kidding? Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a joy to write songs, and I have, um, you know, I do enjoy you know, we all interact with younger people, and mm-hmm. that really is so fun to see, whether in counseling or, you know, in songwriting, just to see the light come on in somebody's eyes. Mm. It's, 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 that's kind of the, that's what hooks you in. Yes. I never really understood that about teaching. Mm. But I, I taught at Belmont lyric writing in their music and their songwriting program wow. for about five years. And before that, I really went in, you know, they say teachers, those that can't do teach mm. or, you know, and those that do, do, you know, there's some, it, it's, it's a, it's a slam against teachers mm. until you become a teacher. Mm. And then you think, oh, wow, it's one or of the greatest. Or you know a teacher very well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. one of the greatest um, joys that you can have mm. is to impart some knowledge and just see the light mm. turn on. So, yes. Mm, yeah. That's been fun. Will you talk a little bit about how you got started writing? Well, you know, I, I have thought about that a lot. I think I've I think I w- I've always written. Mm. Um, I mean, even as uh, a little boy, uh, I just think it's kind of part of, you know, the makeup. Mm. Um, I see things, you know, in stories and words, and Katie sees things visually. Mm. So you know, we all just have our own giftedness our own superpower the way that we see the world and i see it in words and stories so mm. you know it's i mean even as a little boy I, I remember the power of stories and the power of ideas and words and the way that all kind of merge together so i can't really remember a time that i didn't mm. wow right tom will you also talk a little bit about the documentary that you made yeah. we Loved it. We loved laughed. It. We cried. We sang. And <laughs> who would love to hear you talk about how did you end up doing that and what did it mean to you? And before you answer, Netflix, yes. is that where it is? It's no, um, Paramount. Paramount Plus. Yes. And Go watch the documentary. Yeah. It's right incredible. Now. Incredible. Well, thank you. It, it's uh, like most things, I think, that, you know, have success in life, it was really born out of frustration and Mm. failure and pain. I gave a 12-minute speech when I was inducted into the Nashville Songwriters Hall of Fame in 2014. That's all the time they give you. Okay. And I I worked on the speech for months just because, you know, it's like your, it's like your, you know, your opus. It's like your statement. Mm -hmm. And so... I practiced with many, many people. I just have them come in. I said, let me just take 12 minutes and do it. So I got a lot of feedback and I gave it. And it was kind of one of those weird things that you do in life that just happen to have more traction than other things. Mm -hmm. You know, all Mm -hmm. things are not created equal. All days are not the same. There are some days where it's just worse than others. Some days are better than others. This happened to be a day where it kind of came together. So I got all this feedback for I don't know, the next four or five years, like, golly, that, your speech at the Hall of Fame, you know, it, it's viral, it's on, you know, it's on YouTube. I mean, it was just, it was strange. Mm. Frustrating in the sense that I was like, okay, well, great, what do I do with it? <laughs> right. 
in 2018, I was at one of my many low points in my career. Like, this is not happening. Why did I ever start writing songs? I hate writing songs. I really hate myself. And mm. anyway, <clears throat> I'm being overly dramatic. But, uh, and I, at the same time, I got to see Bruce Springsteen perform his play on Broadway. And it's called mm. Springsteen on Broadway. And I went to New York and in a little theater. And for two and a half hours, he was talking about growing up in Freehold, New Jersey. And I took a trip back to 3018 Argonne Drive. Mm. Completely different geography, different families. But it was his story helped me tell my story. Mm. I came back and I thought, gosh, maybe that's what I could do with my 12-minute speech. So I sat down with my son, Tommy, who was the only person on the planet that could endure to spend that much time with me. <laughs> and we expanded my 12-minute induction speech into a one-hour performance. Mm. called. It had many different names. I did that a hundred times. Called Love Tom, right? Well, it was called Kill the Songwriter. It was called Fathers and Sons. It was. Uh. It had many different names and many different iterations, but it evolved. I just enjoyed doing it because it was one of the few things where I could, I didn't have to have permission. I didn't have to have a big setup. I could just like literally come to Daystar and like, I want to tell you a story. It takes mm. about an hour. So I would do it all over. Mm. A guy who makes movies, a director, Michael Lennox, saw it and said, I know how to make a movie of that. So, and I'd done it so much that in February of 2020, right before the uh, pandemic hit, we filmed it over about seven days. We took my one-man performance mm -hmm. and we performed. I mean, we filmed it all over Nashville. Wow. And then um, it took us about, you know, six or seven, eight months to do all the editing and the sound design and the... Uh, the soundtrack it takes a long time to do it. But now it is, if they want to go find it, it is it's called on Love Tom. It's on Paramount Plus, yes. and it's on yes. Love Tom. And yeah, it's really, right. it's just, it's called a letter of, it's called Love Tom, A Letter of Hope to a Desperate World. Mm. And so that's really what the, the, it is my story. But if you tell a story correctly, you know, I think you disappear. And it's not really about me. It's about you and your story and your upbringing. And mm. that's really the joy of, of telling stories is that you see, you kind of, you see people, you know, mm. take their own journey. Which is what you do with every one of your songs. Yes. Well, occasionally. Yes. Which brings us to the next question that we would love to hear. Do you have a favorite of Tom's songs and why? And do you have a favorite mm. of your songs and why? Wow. You know, I am asked that. A lot. I, I should have. I should have a favorite that that pops um, that comes to mind. Okay, she's, not very, she's not very impressed with me, honestly. <laughs> Thirty eight years I've been trying to impress her and uh, it still hadn't worked. I, but. <laughs> no, I'm always impressed with you. The the here's a an answer that kind of makes people want to roll their eyes because that is a difficult question That's to true. answer. But the 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 answer and this is really true. And I'll explain to you why. Okay, you're very curious about what you're really? asking. I have no idea. Well, I, was I have no idea. To, I was trying to I'm help glad you to, out. Thank you. Thank you. So help me out. My favorite song is the next song. Mm. And that you kind of want to slap somebody that says mm. that. But the reality is, as a creative person, if you're not all about the next thing, detaching yourself from the last thing, you're stuck. You're mm. lost. It's yep. over. That's good. That's why you really have to jettison these songs as soon wow. as they come into existence because they take on a life of their own and they really try to capture you. Mm -hmm. They try to, there is a resistance, a creative resistance that tries to keep you from doing the next thing. So you have to fight really tooth and nail against the resistance just to keep going. That's why. Wow. Right, and that is a that great is answer. Good. And thank you for helping me out. But that is not at all <laughs> what I would have said. I was trying to think Try of. To help. No, that was terrific. But I was trying to think of the song where it's like, I love you so much. You're the most beautiful girl in the world. The kind they're that maybe. about that. You say they're all about me. But there are some that I just, every time I'm like, oh, I'm your favorite person in the Aww. world. I just can't remember which one that is right now. Wow. I'm not sure that's good, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I'll I will um, yeah we'll we'll come back to that yes mm. I'll keep trying mm. 
Now, most of your love songs about me are not the ones that are number one hits. It's usually the, the number ones, the ones that make people weep. And right. Mm. Mm. Well, you know what's so true? Tom, I don't know if you even remember this, but I've, I've told you countless times before, like, I am fascinated by your gift. Like, just mm. fascinated that Amen. you could create that kind of emotional experience for someone in three to five minutes. Mm. I'm just, mm-hmm. I'm fascinated by it. And I texted you from the movie theater. Mm. I took, years ago, took my son's to see American Underdog. We're yes. sitting in the theater, the movie's ending, and this stunning song comes on, and I am like three sentences in and weeping. Mm. And I I, I could cry right now just thinking about it. I remember sitting in the dark and thinking, who wrote this? Like mm. I should have even asked that mm. question, you know? Mm. Who wrote this? And your words and Vince Gill's voice. Mm. And I just was like, oh, my stars. I texted you from the theater. Yes. I'm like, you did it again. Right. You did well, it again in three minutes. I'm like weeping at the beauty of your words. And so I'm just mm. fascinated by your gift. And I'm going to jump in and say one of my favorite moments with the two of you is y'all came to Hopetown. Mm-hmm. And oh, yeah. I think the group of kids were seventh and eighth graders. Mm-hmm. And I don't even know that y'all knew this coming in. But, you know, because Hopetown is second through 12th grades, we have groups of kids that come and come for years and get to know each other well. And they, we have had this one group where, I mean, just off the top of my head, I would say we've had one girl who has battled cancer three times. Another one who has twice. We have one child who lost both parents. We have another one who lost a sibling. I mean, the two that lost beloved mm. grandparents real close together. I mean, just the the amount of sorrow mm. in this group is profound. Mm. And I don't think y'all knew that. No. Walking into this no. space. And the two of you came and you sat in Melissa's chair and sang The mm. House That Built Me with these kids, mm. seventh and eighth graders, and and that your music has that impact on yeah. David and these mm. narcissistic seventh right. and eighth grade kids mm. who, <laughs> you know, it's hard sometimes to get them to have any emotion yeah. other than the person that I like doesn't like me back. Right. And even when they've been through hard things or in the yeah. midst of them. And, mm-hmm. and you sang that song. And within, same, within three yeah. lines, I think every person in the room yeah. was weeping so much so that I think that song has become really integral to our ministry mm-hmm. here and we built a whole fundraiser around yeah. it right yes we did evening in December yeah. we're so connected to that song this right. year and yeah it just makes such a difference yeah David you know I love to go out on the water when we're up at the lake I do know that and you love being on the lake Yes, I do, but I don't love that I get seasick kind of easily. Yeah, that could get in the way of enjoying the water. I've been enjoying the lake much more this summer, though, since I started using Relief Band. Relief Band is the number one FDA-cleared anti-nausea wristband. It's been clinically proven to quickly relieve and even prevent nausea and vomiting that comes with motion sickness, anxiety, migraines, hangovers, morning sickness, chemotherapy, and so much more. It's a simple band you wear on your wrist. Yes, and it truly relieves nausea using zero drugs. Relief Band uses technology that works with your body so it's safe and has zero side effects. So if you always have a flashlight on hand for a blackout or a first aid kit on hand for emergencies, then you need a Relief Band for those unexpected nausea moments. Right now, we've got an exclusive offer just for Raising Boys and Girls listeners. If you go to reliefband.com and use promo code RBG, you'll receive 20% off plus free shipping. So head to R-E-L-I-E-F-B-A-N-D.com and use our promo code RBG for 20% off plus free shipping. Sissy, it's hard to believe that summer is already halfway over in our area. Don't remind me, David. That means camp is almost over, too. The school year is quickly approaching, and you may still be considering your schooling options. So we're excited to tell you about our sponsor, Ethos School. Education is changing, and your child deserves more than a one-size-fits-all experience in their learning. 
As a Christian online school, Ethos understands the responsibility parents feel to ensure their child develops academically, socially, and spiritually. Maybe your child is currently enrolled in a private or public school that doesn't offer classes such as Biblical Greek, AP Physics, or Computer Coding. Or maybe you're a homeschool family that's looking for a new curriculum for the upcoming school year. Ethos partners with parents to shape their children as whole people, offering over 100 relational, high-quality online courses for 4th to 12th grade students, including multiple world language, math, dual credit, and advanced placement options, plus weekly time with a live teacher and classmates. At Ethos, families can choose either a single course or a full course schedule. When you visit ethosschool.org slash rbg, Ethos will waive your $95 enrollment fee, plus they are offering each of our podcast listeners a complimentary academic counseling session to plan out your child's academic journey. Ethos's online teachers are expert educators, and each one either has or is currently pursuing a graduate degree. No wonder Ethos advanced placement scores soar above national averages. Again, Ethos is waiving that $95 enrollment fee, so visit ethoschool.org slash rbg or check out the show notes to start planning your child's educational journey with an Ethos academic counselor. Not to get off track, but we're so excited that the next fundraiser will be yes. will have to do with Hope Town. Yes, me too. Yes, at your house. And we are. Kind of, do you know we're going back to Hope Town a week from today? Oh, for work day. Is I that can't work even day? Believe y'all are coming to work. Yes. Day. Allegedly work day. No, yeah, no, no. We are. That's yes, right. A week so from this excited. Friday. I, I mean, a week, a week from, from today. A week from today. Yes, okay. but just yeah. to prepare. Um, for that, and yes. then we can't wait to bring people to your studio and <sighs> and to um, yeah, that's gonna learn be more about Hope Town. Y'all are amazing. Yes, you are. Okay, we've got to go a step back because we started, Katie, mm-hmm. with you talking about growing up, and we want to hear the story of how the two of you met. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Want to hear a little bit about your family, and would love to also ask you about what we might imagine would be one of your favorite job descriptions, which is being grandparents. Mm. Oh, yes. We tell us what that's like. So how do we meet, Katie? Let's see. Um, one reason that Tom is dressed like he is now is because he came from the tennis court. Mm-hmm. And since I've known Tom, um, he has loved tennis a lot. He's really enjoyed it. <laughs> and I'm incredibly average. <laughs> no, incredibly I- average. It's incredible. <laughs> So I, I w- found myself at Christ Pres in the singles class. I had just graduated from Ole Miss in the middle of a. I graduated in December, so um, there I was, probably in January, not knowing. You know, I'm back in Nashville, not knowing what the next chapter would be like. And there I was in the Sunday school class, the singles class, and um, I looked around and thought. Oh, what is life going to be like in a single, you know, (laughs) what will this be like now that I'm no longer in college? Mm. And I looked and on the front row was, um, sat Tom Douglas. And I did lean over to my sister, Julie, Mm -hmm. and said, who is that fella on the front? And she said, he plays tennis with, he was tennis partners with my sister's then boyfriend, now husband, Mm. with Jose Bessiana. So um, we met in Sunday school. Aww. How wholesome that. is that? <laughs> Isn't that something? Could've I mean, there's a, a little more to the story. It, nope, but, it was Sunday school. But we did meet there, yeah. That's <laughs> my version. Do you have a, What's your, a more go, I'm, creative I'm, one? I'm going with your story. No, that's exactly right. It was, it was, it was love at first sight for me. Mm. It just was. It was like, wow. Mm. Of course. So, of course. So yeah, it was. Uh, th- that's I remember the moment. Um, was it very, that day, or was it later? Uh, I think you know. I think it honestly. I mean, it was. It was I think most. What most <laughs> guys think, she's actually that's she's beautiful. But I honestly, she's out of my league. But so you kind of fantasize about wow, what if? But you think yeah, it's probably not going to happen. But that's a very attractive woman. That's what I thought. <laughs> Fast forward Aww. a few months, and um, 
and it, my sister Julie was getting married to Jose, mm. and my roommate um, from Yazoo City, Mississippi, uh. had come to the wedding. And at the reception, I was saying to my roommate Laura, "Laura, I have to introduce you to." There's this fellow there named Tom Douglas, and my my roommate loved music, and and I said. I have to introduce you. You're really going to like this guy, Tom, because you are into music. I didn't own an album. Mm. I, I mean, I was not, um, at that time, was not savvy as far as as music goes. So I wanted to introduce Laura to Tom. So I, Laura and I followed Tom through the whole reception, and I would say, all right, hold on, Laura, wait a minute. Not yet, not yet. And we track him <laughs> through the whole reception area. And then after the whole, the not, I mean, the band was shutting down, and Tom turned around finally to face us, but instead our eyes met, mm-hmm. and I just said, mm, "Never mind, I don't think I'm gonna introduce you." And, and you called me the next morning and asked oh, me out for the first wow. time. There you go. See, that's yeah. cool. There is a God after all. <laughs> Y'all are so that was fun. good too. That's, that that's so good, good detail. That's good. That good, good detail. detail. Yes, that's very good detail. I like that. Well, we want to go. Oh wait, grandparenting. We didn't yes. talk about hit. that. Yeah, you gotta uh, have tell us about your kids first. Mm. Yes, kids and grandkids. You tell. No, your Katie actually is the better storyteller no. in the family. Just okay. Our family. We are <laughs> so um, delighted to have. We have two daughters. And one son. Um, today is our son's birthday, and he's mm. flying in. He's oh, the two girls good. and their husbands live here in town, but Tommy lives in Venice, right outside of Los Angeles. He's flying in right now. Oh. Today's his birthday, so, so you um, get to be with him tonight. Yes, good, we've got. Y'all. We're ready to go. Oh. Um, so those are our kids, and Catherine, our our firstborn, married to Austin Fish. They um, they have a now seven year old daughter, hard to believe. Mm-hmm. So our only grandchild, Christy mm-hmm. Fish, Christy Fish, and, and lovely um, and delightful. Yes. Well, and so she, as I said, she's seven. So for seven years now, the rest of us have been totally just silly over her. Sure. I mean, we get to be children again. That's mm-hmm. my favorite part. Yeah. I feel like I get to experience everything fun about childhood mm. with her, through her eyes, with her, and it's just a blast. What are y'all's grandparent names? Well, oh. mine is, I have, it, it's, it's D-O-N-K. Donk, Donk. Okay. which is fitting <laughs> for the animal, but it was it came from because my daughter Catherine she loved Downton Abbey, mm. and Lord Grantham's name in Downton Abbey was Donk. Oh, I forgot that. And so mm-hmm. uh, that was the name that was given to me. So you just I accept could see the name. You and Lord Grantham. <laughs> that feels yes. yes. See? I, yes. I totally get that. Yes. 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 Well, I hadn't really Same thought. Same kind of like warmth. Kind of Kind of thank caring, you. yes, yeah. I could see that. Thank you. Anyway, and Katie's is, and I'm Lovey. Lovey mm-hmm. feels very Love fitting as well. We fitting. didn't choose our names. Catherine worked on it for nine months. <laughs> yes, she did. From the minute she found out she was expecting, Aww. she she tried out different yeah. names, and mm-hmm. that's where she landed. Mm. So what a gift there we are. to Creasy to have mm-hmm. the two of you that as grandparents. Yes. I can't even. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, and, you know, Katie nor I. Well, I had a very close relationship with my grandmother, um, but Katie did not. It, it, mm. You know, in this day and age, it's kind of rare to have. Um, you know, yeah, family. I just didn't know any of gra- my grandparents. They yeah. all well, they lived far away, and then they um, they actually passed away at a relatively young age. Yeah. So I didn't know any grandparents. So I have no idea mm. what I, I don't have a model per se. Mm-hmm. So I think we would both say our model. grandparents shaped so much of who we are. Hundred percent, yes. really? So, yes. So your role is so yeah, it's so significant. important. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So they were yeah. both and with you, I mean, kind of growing up in in both. Interesting. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Like when I get to heaven, 
after Jesus and my mom, like my grandmother is the next person I want to be in line. Really? Yes. yes. Wow. Yes. Yeah. So she well, See, one yeah. day I would like to hear from you. What do you remember? I mean, I want to be, I want to hear, these are the things that I remember. Yeah. This is, because I want to copy it. Mm. I want to know. Yeah. I think so much of what y'all are doing naturally, no, that delighting in that's mm. such, I mean, that is sure my grandmother. My biggest memory is I, we had Cokes and Oreos. I would go stay with her when my parents would travel, which <laughs> was a good bit. And every afternoon we'd have, we called them Cokies. I don't know why. Cokies and Oreos. And we would watch Casper together. How Remember Casper, funny. the friendly yes. ghost, which is so simple, but yeah. I felt so delighted in. And I wow. knowing stories about your grandmother. Would, that's exactly would, the word I was going to use. I don't, I don't have a memory of walking in her house when mm. she didn't say, there you are. Mm. Like just mm. all of her attention turned mm. in my direction and thought, wow, this woman is crazy about me. I never mm. questioned that in her company. Yeah. Mm. Which I know the two of you are offering. Wow. You guys. Wow. What a gift to Creasy. You better step it up. <laughs> no, <laughs> I am confident. Keep doing what you're doing. Confident. Okay, so this season of our podcast is based on some books we did called Raising Emotionally Strong Boys, Him, mm-hmm. Raising Worry-Free Girls. So we're talking about raising emotionally strong and worry-free kids. And so we would love for you to each tell mm-hmm. a story mm-hmm. from growing up that has helped shape who you are. Oh, goodness. The fir- wow. I could, this is only the first one that That's pops great. into my mind. Good. That's usually the best. I think I was that goofy seventh grader, mm-hmm. the one you just described at Hopetown, where he said that all <laughs> they care about is he doesn't like, you know, right. so and so. I like him, and he doesn't like me back. Mm. I was that that person, um, but I do remember walking into. You ready for this, Wharton High School? No, it wasn't high school because it was junior high. Mm. If you're set in the seventh grade. And um, not knowing my place, I, I mean, it was just, I was one really little skinny girl in a room full of 20-something seventh graders, and I was voted president of the class. Wow. And there was, it was just that, I just, to this day, I remember that, and I was not a natural leader but but here's the part I do remember. One of my parents' friends came over to the house and gave me a gavel. Mm. So to be, wow. I felt, again, I just wow. felt like I had been, um, well, how does that affect me now? Well, I haven't thought of it in a hundred years. Mm. But to be, to actually, don't we all just want to be, I wanted to be seen mm-hmm. and seen for what I could maybe mm. do not for what I was mm. doing. Yes. So when I look back on that, when you're asking about my childhood, it's like, mm. what a vote of confidence. Yes. Thank you. And thank you to my parents' friends who played along. Wow. Mm. That's, that's Yeah. Really yeah, cool. I just think you know, that, I mean, there's so many layers that they would be that cognizant of this award for a seventh grader mm. and that they would then take the time to, I mean, all the steps. Yeah. yeah. And then, Yes, I'm sure they're like, bless her heart. That one right there really needs something. <laughs> we better take her a gavel. Wow. 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 Um, you know, I think um, the, you know, growing up, you, you need somebody to kind of help tell you who you are. Mm-hmm. Um, you can't really figure, I, I mean, I guess, you know, if you're exceptionally talented, you know that at an early age, but most of us are not exceptionally talented. Mm. And so you need somebody to point out your, here's what, here's who you are. Mm. And, you know, my father just kind of, I mean, he, he, I I tell this in in the film and in my performance, which is just, uh, he loved music. He loved the Beatles. Um, after the Beatles were on the Ed Sullivan show, we went, you know, shortly thereafter to Metro Music and Buckhead, and he just said, "We're buying you a guitar. Mm. You're going to be a guitar player." Wow. wow. And he, he, and oddly enough, he took it. He came in the next day. He said, "Actually, you're not a guitar player. You're going to be a bass player." Mm. We took the six string back and got a bass guitar. Really? That's how specific oh. he was. Wow. So Isn't that interesting. interesting? Yes. And you were how old at that time? 
Well, this is 1964. The Beatles were on the Ed Sullivan Show in February of 1964. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So how old would you have been? 11. Wow, Tom. That's kind of, I hadn't really thought about in the significance of, we've got to have people, you know, direct us or, you know, start to put some guardrails around. Mm. And, uh, you know, we need targets. We need- Mm. And a purpose. And a purpose. Yes, that's, that's what it was. Yes, that's so good. And you know, I think uh, <laughs> it's emotional. Looking <laughs> back, wow, I hadn't really thought of that <laughs> mm. moment. Mm. I'm thinking about you being 11, and Tom, when I teach on stage three of a boy's development, I talk yeah. about that stretch as the second set of formative years. Mm. Yeah. And I talk about how much emotional and social growth happens in that time for boys and just thinking about you being an 11-year-old boy yeah. and mm. given that gift and yeah. that called out in you that yes. you would go on to be yeah. this man who writes these songs <laughs> that just move me to tears mm. sitting in a theater. You know, yes. it just, wow, yeah. how grateful. What a gift to all of us that you're yeah, a in that. Yeah, amen to that. Yeah, that was, he was very specific. Mm. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's good. Thank you both for sharing that. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. We Gavel loved it. and a bass guitar. It's a good yes, combo. Right. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. We love to also ask you to, building on that, like, what are some things that you would say helped your kids become more emotionally strong or worry free? Hmm. One thing that we were very intentional about always from from the our first little one raising all three is to always we always ate dinner together mm. every night mm. and and dinner together around the table I mean you don't start eating till after the blood so you but we ate together as a family and because of Tom's gift set, I mean, they would all roll their eyes, but there was really not a dinner that happened where there wasn't a time when it would get quiet and Tom would begin to ask questions. I bet. I was of just you imagine. started picturing. Yeah. I thought, I yes. wish I'd had a camera on the conversations you all did. had. Not just him. You <clears throat> too. Oh, yeah. But you especially, I mean, so it's so, thoughtful. I, I've been trained by, mar- by marrying Tom, I mean, all these years of being around him. And he would ask the questions to the littles. Um, mm. And it could start with, all right, everybody go around. What was the highlight and low light of your day? You know, sometimes it was as simple as that. Mm. But um, even now, you still do that now. And we all learn from it. Mm. We learn about each other, but we learn how to ask questions. I mean, we use that now when we're at dinner parties. I'm like, okay, what would Tom say right now? You know, mm. you find yourself at a table mm-hmm. and you think, all right, everybody, let's. I want to draw you out. Mm. Creasy now when we're at the table, <laughs> mm-hmm. which, again, she's still the only little one. So picture all these, there'll be seven adults and Creasy. And she'll say, Donk, can we do that thing? Mm. And which means, can I, can I ask the question? And then Creasy will say, all right, sissy. She'll turn, look across the table and ask you, can you tell me one thing that made you laugh today mm. or something? So wow. she's, she sees Y'all, it as a game. Gift. But she's learning that already. Yeah. Wow. So that is a tool and just a practice that mm. that forms all of us. Well, I mean, that's what you all do that in counseling. Mm. I mean, counseling yes. is just asking questions, getting, I mean, we all, that's just the way that we, you get to be known. Mm. And, um, but uh, yes, we do it. For a career, mm-hmm. but but to have someone that sits across, and I have been at a dinner party with you all, and have experienced mm-hmm. that firsthand, and I, mean, I just don't think people do that anymore. Well, I, and it's I, such I, a gift. Know, I don't, I, I've often wondered that: is that are as as the culture become progressively more self consumed and narcissistic mm-hmm. than it was, you know, fifty years ago? Yes. I I. I mean, you all would know that better than I know that. But we talk about in "Are My Kids on Track?" One of our books, we talk about the social. It's social, right? Reciprocity. I yeah, feel like it's emotional and social. But 
and and we talk about practicing it with kids in our office. Like I throw you a tennis ball and ask yeah, you a question, right. you throw yeah. me a tennis uh, ball yeah. back, and you ask a question. Teaching kids to do that, and I think I'm more and more convinced that when I'm around adults, that so often a conversation is. I tell my story, and all you're doing is pushing uh, pause on yours, y- yeah. so you can tell yours right. again. Oh, it's, you know, and that's oh. it's just so different. That sense of really wanting to know someone, what you're doing. Well, and you know, and I have noticed this a lot over the last few years that how people will will they, they are they're waiting for a pause just so they can tell you, you know, jump in and tell you their story. Or people really, this is. Maybe just a eccentricity, me. But people interrupt so much; you, yes. you don't even get to finish a sentence. And it it it's kind of a, a data download. And I don't know because we're all so lonely or so isolated that we don't get to talk. But man, all you got to do is just ask somebody a small question, and it's it it it's I don't, it's it's great in a way, but it's kind of sad in a way because it's a monologue; it's not a dialogue. Right. Yes. It's, and that, that's a real loss, I think. Mm-hmm. And it's hard to have a relationship where it's just a monologue. Yes. It's Very probably true. the way Katie feels in our marriage. Like, <laughs> I'm just talking all the time. And we probably didn't answer the question. We no, didn't. I love I what you said. Answer yeah. the you question have an, directly. Yes, you have. Do you have an answer that you would say with your kids, something? You know, I, I think, that's yeah, I hadn't really thought that. of that. But, um, you know, growing up, I grew up in, in an era where... Uh, Education and job security were really paramount in my family because my both my parents were older when I was born and both children of the Depression. Mm. So you get a job, you get a good education, and you get a job, and you literally stick with it for 45 years. And that really was, honestly, I look, that was very admirable. My Both my parents kind of worked when they did work. And, you know, they were just, it wasn't about what I want to do or, you know, finding my fulfillment, it's getting the house paid off. It's, you know, it's making sure that we've, it wasn't, you know, a week skiing and, you know, Beaver Creek. It was just, you know, we're just kind of, we're going to make it. So I don't know that this is correct, but I really would be curious to your answer because opposed to, you know, overlaying that on my children, I think we raised them to life, is short work is drudgerous if you can find something that you really love to do it may take you longer you may not make as much money but you will have a more fulfilled life if you can find that passion so you know i think with our children we tried to i call it a superpower just because it sounds a little more exciting than a calling Mm. it's like i think everybody literally has got a superpower let me help you find your superpower because it's something in there. Mm. I think we've tried to help them find their superpower. Yeah. Um, and then, hey, embrace it. You may have to you know, work in a Starbucks at the same time that you pursue your passion. It's not either or. Sometimes it's both and. Mm. But you, know, you may have to have a side hustle for a long time to fulfill your passion. But you know, just make sure you're doing something that you love to do rather than like as Thoreau said, live lives of quiet desperation. Mm. Mm. Yeah. But more than anything, I have to say this. At, at, um, our children are not worry-free even now. No. Nor are their parents. Right. We aren't. I mean, we are still stumbling along. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But we, the older we get, I think the, the better we get at stumbling in front of them in a way, meaning Mm. being honest about um, our need for Christ Mm. and and continuing to tell them with our words and our own lives that um, that He is He is our hope, He is Mm. our strength, He is our peace, Mm. mainly that, Mm. I mean, as far as opposite of anxiety I would think of his peace and I would think that he is he mm. is and he offers mm. himself so um you have certainly always Tom that has been just as you've coached about their passions and what they'll do as far as work you've always pointed them to Christ mm. well, thank you that's beautiful both of you yeah 
Thank you. Um, okay, I want to go back to the early years of parenting. What is something that you worried about in those years that you wish you hadn't? Schoolwork. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I was determined that Tommy would become an Eagle Scout, which he did. And I was, but it was, <laughs> it almost drove both of us nuts. <laughs> <laughs> and now neither one of us like, well, that's not true. But anyway, it did. I'm so happy he did it. But, you know, just kind of some of those things that you just, Attached it's to. not really about you. It's about me. Mm. I'm going to feel better about myself if you're mm. an Eagle Scout. Mm. I'm going to feel better about myself if you get in a good college. I'm going to feel better about myself what your SAT score is. It's just all that, those things that we put on our children. It's exhausting. Mm. It's not even mm. about them. It's about, you know, mm. me. Wish. We hadn't done that. I I did that much more than Katie. Yeah. Great reminder. Yeah. Anything to add? No, I'll have to think about that. I mean, I we were so in the moment when they were little that mm. yeah, I my greatest concerns were where are we supposed to be in the next five minutes? Yeah. <laughs> Is it on my calendar? Have right. we turned in the forms? Mm. Those type of things. Mm-hmm. Which are um, just taking care of business. Mm-hmm. We'd sure. actually like to now come back and redo this whole podcast again now that we have some semblance of what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. We want to erase oh, all this. Now let's I start just, over. Okay, no, now no, let's start no. recording. This has been one of my favorite conversations <laughs> oh, we've ever me. had. Y'all, Two. this is amazing. The wisdom. I know. The transparency. So much wisdom. I know. And even continuing to think on the early years. Is there one statement that you wish someone had said to you as you started this mm-hmm. parenting journey? Oh, laugh more, la- then laugh more, and then relax and laugh more. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. With okay. your kids. Yeah. Oh, that's it's like so a t-shirt. good. It's like a t-shirt. But a t-shirt. I, was, I was really, I was so great with littles, except for mm. I was like an annoying keeping everything all squared away mm. and on schedule and and but I wish I'd been a little wild and crazy mm. you know messy I wish I'd mm. you know let's play let's mm-hmm. I mean we did play but we played a little too neatly I think mm. yeah everybody's a genius in hindsight is this right. right how would you answer that well I I think and we all know Paige Brown. I think she says, uh, you, in, in this day and age, you're always really safe if you quote Tim Keller, C.S. Lewis, or Paige Brown. Like, you, can't, <laughs> you can't go wrong. I agree. But I think Paige said, um, it may not be okay, but you're going to be okay. Mm. Mm-hmm. So we can't really control the outcome. You're going to be okay, number one, because Jesus loves you. And I love you, and that ain't ever going to change. So, I don't know about the rest of it, but you're going to be you're going to be fine mm. because he's got you, and I got you. Mm. It's beautiful. That's, that's beautiful. That's, that's a good one. Well, I feel like y'all have already answered this question thirty times, but but we talk so much. I mean, being in the business of emotion, yeah, and. When we talk with kids, wanting them to have some truths that they can anchor themselves to in the midst of that. And we would love to hear one truth that you each feel like you are anchoring yourself to Mm. these days in life. Oh, boy. You've said so many. I had no no other truth to anchor myself or ourselves to than not the thought of Jesus, but the person of Jesus. Mm. Mm. Yeah. That... Yeah. Of who he is mm. and and that we are his. Mm. Mm. Yes. Yeah. This is Good Friday on the, mm. while, while we're recording this. So, mm. yeah, I mean, just the reality of that, just mm. the reality of what Jesus was doing. And then mm. we have, you know, Sunday, Resurrection Sunday to look forward to yes. is, wow. I mean, he has overcome the, our greatest, what's our greatest fear? Mm. Richie Sessions preached this past Sunday. It's like, we all got a lot of fears, but like the greatest fear mm. is death. Mm. And he has overcome yeah. that. If we could mm. just 
cling to that, if I could remember that from one minute to the next, all these other things are so insignificant compared to that. Mm, yeah. So the grief, the tragedy, the sorrow, the loss, the disappointment, the failure, mm. it's like he's got it. Mm. And we're going to be okay. It may not, but we are going to be okay because he is going to rise from the dead on mm. Sunday. Mm. Mm. One of the things Melissa taught when at some camp sometime along the way, she said there's always a promise. Yes. That wherever we are, whatever we're going through, there's always a promise. Yes. And I'm sure y'all saw that picture that circulated of Covenant. Yes. Yeah. With the rainbow. With the rainbow. Yes. The dark cloud and the rainbow. That was. Yes. That was truly surreal. Yes. Mm-hmm. And you just reminded us, both of you. Mm. Promise. Well, and when you reflected on that sermon, Tom, and and this Sunday, Katie knows the story because I told it to her in the kitchen this week. But I had come in from out of town speaking late after the week that we had all lived. And we were home. My wife and I were home that morning watching church. And the service opened. I haven't told you this this evening. The service opened. And Tom is singing, Love Has the Last Word. Mm. And I just started weeping, like, there it is again, Tom, like your words, mm. that truth, who you are, all those things. I looked at my wife and I said, I'm going down right now, Tom is singing. <laughs> Get the tissue. We're in the first 30 seconds of church and I'm going down. And just feels like today has been the sweetest mm. gift to sit with the two of you yes, and have this has. time. Well, we're I, privileged and honored to be yeah. here, truly. Oh. We're so appreciative of what you all have you you've almost mm-hmm. carried the whole city on your mm-hmm. shoulders the last two weeks so i know you got to be exhausted and tired i hope you can yeah. get some rest but thank you for representing nashville and daystar mm-hmm. and all of us you really carried us thank you i feel pretty certain y'all have read frederick beekner yeah yes he's my favorite and you were saying something that reminded me of of him and it's where he's talking about how to kind of find God's voice and your calling. Yeah. And he says, by and large, a good rule for finding out is this. The kind of work God usually calls you to is the kind of work that you need most to do and that the world most needs to have done. Wow. The place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. Wow. And I, I mean, what you do, obviously, but I think both of who you yeah. are. I mean, everything that we have been talking about feel like that y'all are living in that space. The way that you love and the way that you encourage and the fact that you started off the service at West mm-hmm. End and, and that all of that comes out of an extension of who you are and yes. that you all give so deeply and with such resounding truth. And I think, gosh, I'm just, I'm so excited for people to hear this episode yeah, well, and to get to know y'all a little because you are certainly two of our favorite people. Yes. Thank you. Trust you so much. Thank you. Thank you. How and fortunate we, want to talk about we are. Talkers. Yeah. Fortunate <laughs> we are to know you too. Yes. And we, though this is a parenting podcast, we end every episode with something fun and food related. Really? So mm-hmm. we do. And because <laughs> we love food. And so we've got a two part question we ask every guest. First part is queso or guac. Oh, wow. And second part is what's your favorite taco? Well, those those are good questions because we really like all of that. We lived <laughs> in Texas for 13 years. Mm-hmm. That's right. And that's the queso capital, mm-hmm. right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So um, I would have to, I mean, I would want equal parts of both, the queso mm-hmm. and the guac. I'd be 50-50. Yes. But if I have to choose one, it's guac because mm. it's so much healthier, you see. Mm. Yes. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, it depends on the guac. Like, what was the restaurant that used to do it right at the same Oh, the, uh, the one in the golf. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I that, that was, was, that. was a little mm-hmm. spicy, mm-hmm. and it was like— yeah. it, was, it was really good. I mean, it was so fresh. Yes. I mean, the fresh avocado like that, spectacular. Mm. I, Outside of that, I would say I would say queso, and I would say I, I would I almost always choose a beef taco. Mm. I mean, Do like we have a favorite beef. taco? We don't really eat. I mean, Katie makes great tacos, mm. uh, but that I never even think about. Like, 
How about you all? Is, is there a favorite? Can we flip taco? the question back to it? you? No, they're not going to answer. David, what's your favorite? Taco? We're always happy to talk about it. Well, I'm a huge fan of Ladybird Taco. I live within walking distance. Oh, we don't even don't know, even know where that. that is. Oh, where, where is it? Well, that? just wait. The gift bag that you're holding is about to change that. Oh. Wow. Breakfast tacos started by these three amazing men from Austin, Texas. So Lady Bird Lake that runs around downtown yes. yeah. Austin. Yeah, one of whom is in the music industry. Yes. Mm-hmm. Amazing people, mm-hmm. incredible food. Their slogan is a little Texas in Tennessee. So wow. you all can go back to your roots. Oh, we're mm-hmm. so excited. Yes. What if we went there for lunch? That'd be you great. could should. and you, you should. You can go right over. It's possible. You're five mm-hmm. minutes. Mm-hmm. Really? Yeah, yeah you're so south. close. It's in 12 South. Oh, okay. well, that's right. great. Thank you. Thank you're you. welcome. Enjoy. Thank you very much. Well, And I love Superica. Have y'all been to Superica? No. no. It's another Texan from Houston, Port Fry, who also has a lot of restaurants in Atlanta. He lives really? in Atlanta now. And they have um, queso compuesto that is queso mixed with guac. Ooh, and wow. a little ground beef and See, some pico. Everything we like. It's really good. It's really good. Wow. It's in the gulch is the area. They should be your branding partners here. <laughs> yes, you're right. Y'all, thank you. This was right, fun. Thanks, thanks for you. having so us. Fun for us. So much fun. Ugh. It's our joy to bring the experience and insight we gain through our work beyond the walls of the Daystar House. If you enjoyed this conversation, please share it with your friends. And don't forget to click the follow button in your favorite podcast app so you never miss an episode. To learn more about our parenting resources or to see if we're coming to a city near you, visit our website at RaisingBoysAndGirls.com. Join us next time for more help and hope as you continue your journey of raising boys and girls. Raising Boys and Girls.